The Gospel lesson takes us back again to the Sermon on the Mount, the foundational teaching of Jesus. He had been followed by the crowds because he had been healing. He had been giving words of hope, things to which they weren't accustomed. And so while he sought to teach those first 12 that he had called to a special ministry with him, the others crowded around to hear. Now, if you remember the beginning of chapter 5 that we read in worship just a few weeks ago, and most of you know as the Beatitudes, he's talking about the blessings of God that don't seem necessarily likely. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be filled. And he goes on to, in the Sermon on the Mount to say some things that are even less sensible to those who are listening. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ from the fifth chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be, be to God. God. It's a tough passage. Then we get to that last line, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we think that must let us off the hook because we're not perfect. Only God is perfect, so I don't even have to try for these things. That's not quite true. Every United Methodist pastor who is ordained has to answer questions that were formulated centuries ago by John Wesley. Are you going on to perfection? And we sort of mumble, uh, yeah. And then the second question is very much like the first. Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? Well, I was ordained by Bishop Joseph Hughes Yackel, who was one of the first bishops of the United Methodist Church, meaning he was elected in 1968 when the Methodist Church merged with the Evangelical United Brethren in Christ. He came from the EUB side of the United Methodist family, and those were not questions they were asked. And the first time he had to ask them when he was ordaining a class of people, he thought, what a ridiculous question. Are you going on to perfection? None of us will ever be perfect. Only God in Jesus Christ is perfect, he thought. But then he said later, he thought on, if the answer is no, then where the heck are you going if it's not on to perfection? To be made perfect in love is not to be made perfect or sinless or faultless before God, because as we said, only Christ is sinless and perfect and faultless before God. But to be made perfect in love is to get to a point where your motivations and all your desires are rooted in God's love for us in Jesus Christ, rooted in his cross, rooted in his life of giving and self-giving love. And so, let's look at perfection not as being sinless, but maybe if we understood it as being brought to completeness, which is really a better translation of that passage from the Greek. Or what if we even want to step for farther and said to ourselves, what if it is brought to be more like Christ, more like our intended purpose as God's people? We've been studying forgiveness during this Lenten season, and it's a tough one because it's hard to forgive. We confuse it. We said last week, forgetting means you have to, forgiving means you have to forget, but that's not true. Forgiving means giving up the right to revenge, turning the other cheek. But sometimes it's hard to keep turning cheeks if you feel that all you do is get slapped down. So what is Jesus talking about here? He says if someone asks you to go one mile, go a second mile. That is a very specific reference to the Roman occupation in first century Palestine. Someone, either a centurion or sometimes just a regular soldier marching, could grab a Jew from the 
street side from his place of work and force him to carry his equipment for a mile. That was the limit of the law. But Jesus says, if you're forced to go a mile, don't stop there, but say, I will go with you a second mile. And if someone takes your coat, give them your cloak as well. Meaning, if someone takes the bare necessities of your life, you give them the barest necessities of your life. You give them even more, because that is the way to show them who God is. It's also a way to claim power. Because what if we look at going on to perfection? What if we look at being made perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect, as becoming more Christ-like in our daily living? What if we look at it as not something we're forced to do or mandated to do or something the law requires of us, but as something that Christ himself, through the power of his Holy Spirit, gives us the power to do in his holy name? What if vulnerability that is done willingly is a sign of power? What if we are stronger in our weakness? A good lesson for this very precarious time in our life together in the world as brothers and sisters across the globe that is struggling against a pandemic. What if we claim our strength in Christ? I think we would live differently. Laws are hard to follow, aren't they? Because we tend to revolt and rebel and be stubborn about laws. We don't like speed limits. We don't like helmet laws if you ride a motorcycle. And a lot of people don't even like seatbelt laws. So they made the seatbelts go beep, 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 <laughs> beep, 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 and make it so annoying that you have to, have to, have to, have to put it on. The Old Testament laws were very stringent. And we look at them now and we're a little confused. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But that was justice in those days. That was let the crime, the punishment fit the crime. So if someone lost an eye, they couldn't take your life. If someone was hurt in an accident, they couldn't demand your life. Or if you stole someone some, from someone, you didn't have to necessarily require their hand to be cut off in punishment. But Jesus is saying these laws were meant to be justice. But God's justice is deeper. God's righteousness requires more of us. And forgiveness is something that we're required to do. But what if we look at it as something we're empowered to do instead of something that we are required to do to prove that we're Christ's people? What if instead we look at forgiving one another as a way of being more like Christ through the power of his Holy Spirit? Some of us have been reading the book Amish Grace, how, Grace trans how forgiveness transcended tragedy. It goes back to the story that happened, unfortunately, close to where we live in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, in the West Nickel Mines community, when a man who was grieving the death of his child decided that he was going to return the grief that he experienced with evil against other children. And so he armed himself. And he went into an Amish schoolhouse, a building without a lock on the door or any sense of security systems or even a telephone. And he murdered five children. We cannot wrap our heads around the murder of children in any circumstance, but especially it seems in the Amish community, who are a distinct people, who are a peaceful, nonviolent people, a people who choose a way of life that brings them as close to God as they can be. As I've said in previous sermons, they pray the Lord's Prayer every day. It's the only prayer that's prayed aloud in the Amish community for fear of being boastful or using flowery words if you try to compose a prayer for others to read. So what did they do? They immediately forgave the man who hurt their children. We can't imagine that. Now, what happened in the community was surprising to a lot of non-Amish, what they call the English people around them, their English neighbors, and the larger world around them, because there were people who condemned them for forgiving. I read an article from the Boston Globe, and I included it in the packet of information that we're reading, those of us who are studying the book. And the writer said, I don't want to be like this, dispassionate about the death of children. They were hardly dispassionate. Their hearts are broken and still aching. 
I met with a member of the Nickel Mines community just a few weeks ago, and as he sat and shared with me his remembrance of the event, his eyes filled with tears. And he shook his head and he said, we just will never know why. But that did not stop their forgiveness. And some people think they sat together in a group and decided whether they would forgive or not. That wasn't how it happened. It's just the way they live. They don't have Sunday school. They don't have religious education. They have no seminaries. And yet, forgiveness is natural to them as breathing because they seek Christ above all things. And in that community of meek people that we look at and some look down upon, we see the power of God at work. Tonight's film that we're not going to see, if you have Amazon Prime, you can see it as part of that benefit called Forgiving Dr. Mengele. It's a story, it's a documentary about a woman named Ava Kors who died just this past July. She and her family were taken to Auschwitz, the concentration camp, because they were Jews. She watched her mother being dragged away from her children screaming and she never saw her again. That was the last memory she had of her mother being pulled from her children and taken to the gas chambers. Ava and her sister, however, were spared because they were twins. And Dr. Mengele, a physician whose Hippocratic oath begins with do no harm, used Jews to experiment upon pregnant women and twins. They were injected with chemicals and drugs to see what would happen to them. And Ava Kaur said she stayed alive by the sheer force of will because she knew if she died that her sister would be euthanized so they could perform a double autopsy. We cannot imagine the horrors that she endured at eight years old. So what did she do? Years after the war, she decided that the burden of this was too much for her to bear. And through the strength of her faith in God, the God of our ancestors, because Ava was a Jew, she chose to forgive because it freed her. And she said the moment that she forgave Dr. Mengele, who had never asked to be forgiven, who thought he had no reason to be forgiven, who was trying to perfect an Aryan race by eliminating Jews from the planet, he didn't deserve her forgiveness, and yet she forgave him through the power of her will. And for that, she was criticized. Well, forgiveness does that, doesn't it? It's a powerful thing. And if you don't understand it, you might choose to condemn it. There were people who even faulted Pope John Paul II when he forgave the man who shot him. Someone said to me, how could he do that? The man tried to kill him. My answer was, well, you know, he kind of is the Pope. He and Jesus are sort of like this. But forgiveness, if you wait for it to be a natural inclination, you're going to wait a long time. Because forgiveness does not come easily. Nor does giving your cloak when someone has stolen your coat. Or voluntarily going the second mile when you've been forced to go one. Or turning the other cheek when you've just been slapped. It's not easy, but it's possible. The epistle lesson that Bill read from the letter of Titus is one that we usually read Christmas Eve or Christmas morning. Let's look at it again. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led us slaves astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, through the water of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. This spirit he poured on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Are you going on to perfection? Do you expect to be made perfect in love in this life? Bill and I had to answer those questions at our ordination. 
But I think they're questions that God asks of each follower of Jesus Christ. Are you going on to perfection? Are you going to be made perfect in love in this life? Are you going to let my spirit work through you to fill you and use you and let you forgive the worst of offenses in the name of the one who forgave all our sins? I agree with Bishop Yackel. If we're not going on to perfection, where the heck are we going? To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.